Um, so I was uh, with my son yesterday, and uh, he's reducing the fraction. And one of the, I guess they were divisible, like the numerator was kind of a long number, and he's like, this is divisible by three. So, if you knew a trick, you guys know this trick to find when one of the numbers is divisible by three. What is the trick? Right, yeah. digits. So, I don't remember what the number was. So it's like 400. Like seven digits. So if you have four plus one plus seven, you get like twelve, and that's just the black here. So I said, you know, my students should know why that's true now that we're like doing modular arithmetic. Because well, you shouldn't know. <laughs> but here's why it's true. Right? If I have like a number, let's say I have digits like D N, D M minus so this is like a really silly way of doing it, but I'm I'm writing the digits, C for the digit, the N, nth place. So, like here, we would have this as like D3, D2, D1. So, then what does that mean? What is, when we write a number, what does it mean? Nobody knows. Right? So, you get to college. Right? This is the sum. The n times 10 to the n, the n minus one, and the n minus one. So I thought about that all the way plus 10. Oh, wait a minute. I do. I guess I want to make this n plus one. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm off it. I guess I want to start with zero. <laughs> sorry, I'll go up to sorry, sorry. Let me let me go up to n, but then start at zero. My bad. So this would be d zero d zero. I want the, the index to denote the exponent of the of the ten. I should start at zero. Okay. So then we go ten to ten to the one is d one plus d nine. And these Z's have to be between zero and nine, right? Integers between zero and nine. So this is a base 10. And you guys all know how to put things in other bases. Well, these computer scientists know how to put things in base two, right? They can convert um, using a different number and having a your digits. Anyway, so let's say we say this is divisible by three or nine, actually, that one works. Um, if it's divisible by three, then we know that this is actually this number is congruent to zero mod three. That's the same thing as the same as divisible by three. It means that three divides that number. There's no remainder. But we know mods of arithmetic now. So if we look at this left hand side, what is 10 congruent to mod three? One. So since arithmetic works relative to congruence, we have 10 is one. So this is 10, d to the n times one to the n. That's just d to the n. So that's just saying that this is if and only. Same thing works with none. That's why the trick works. I didn't tell him this. He was already mad at me. <laughs> really good at math, doesn't really love doing it. I don't blame him, I guess. It's rough. Okay. So question. Yeah, please. Why doesn't that work? Right. So why doesn't it work? Let's say we did it with seven. Well, the problem is a seven is congruent to three, or to ten is congruent to three mod seven, and as a, and so then I would get three to the n, you know, three to the n minus one. I would get something else, but you could do you could say something, 
but you just wouldn't get the facility so, of the summit. You were to put the summit here, you would have a system of the summit is if it were going to be. Absolutely. Isn't there a version of this you can do with like 11 to get like three of the sum? Yep. Now, if you do this with 11, then 10 is congruent to negative one. So you can put negative one in there, and that's how. Yeah, fun things, right? That's what arithmetic is fun. <laughs> okay, so today, all right. So I looked over it. I, I'm not stressing too much. Okay, we're not gonna. You're not gonna master necessarily the last few sections of this chapter, but I'd like you to read through them, and we're gonna touch on each of them um, over today and tomorrow. But you know, don't don't worry too much if you don't feel completely comfortable with everything. Okay. But I do want to get the sort of correspondence theorem, and then talk a little bit about products today. I think those two things uh, would be good. So let's go to the theorem. Uh, but we have a proposition before we get to the theorem. It's kind of a funky looking proposition, but it's it's a nice thing. We'll start out with a couple of proofs, and then we'll we'll do uh, we'll do some examples. Okay, so this proposition may look a little a little intimidating, but I don't know. Maybe it's because they got this math cal symbol here. <laughs> That's a G. So I've got two groups. I've got a homomorphism from one to the other, and they've got this kernel K. And then they're taking some subgroup inside of this codomain group here, inside of where G is being sent. Now, there's the, the idea is what you want to do if you have a homomorphism is you really want to relate these two groups. You don't want, just want to say, okay, there's a map between them, whatever. You want to say, okay, I've got some algebra, algebraic structure on this uh, G tilde or this Cal G here. And I want to sort of see what kinds of algebraic structures I can get on G from that using the homomorphism. And one thing you can do is you can just take the inverse image, that's what they call it, of a subgroup. So let's draw a diagram. We have some G in here, going to G here. And inside of here, we have some subgroup script H. So what we look for is we're going to look for all of the elements that map to H in G. That's what we call the inverse image. H. This is really, what is it? It's just the set of elements in G that map to the script H. All those things that go to the script H. So what do they say? They say, okay, then this guy is just actually, it's not a subset. It's just, I mean, it is a subset, but it's more than that. It's a, it's a subgroup of G. Um, they don't furthermore say if it's, if this guy is normal, then so is this guy. H is normal, regular H is normal. Um, and then they finally say, okay, if we have a surjective morphism, uh, homomorphism, um, and H is normal, then, then, then the script H is actually normal too. So they, they can go the other way as well. So this last statement is just saying that if we'd started with H here and this were surjective and we knew it was normal, then this guy would be normal. So some kind of correspondence. And Okay, so when we talk about the correspondence theorem, I'll try to kind of fill in this picture a little more. Right now it's, it's a little funky, but uh, I want to give you a clearer picture of what's going on here in a second. So I won't, uh, let's prove maybe one part of this. Uh, we can just prove that this guy is a subgroup. I think that all of the proofs here are, are sort of elementary, just follow the definitions. Um, and they're in the book, so like you want to read further, please do. So let's just show that this is a subgroup. <laughs> it's a claim. 
So why is it true? What do we need to show for this? If we have a subset of a group and we want to show it's a subgroup, what do we need to show? Right. We have three properties we want to show are satisfied. One of them is, well, someone give me one of them. Identity. Okay. So let's check. So A, one, P of one, where does identity go under our homomorphism? It goes to the identity of the other group, right? So if I should maybe write one sub G, this is going to be one subscript G, but this script H is a subgroup of script G. So we know that this script H has the identity of script G because it's a sub. So by the definition written right here, of this the inverse of H. Now we have that one of G. By definition. Okay, so the identity, what else do we need to show? Inverse. inverse. So if G is an element of H, uh, then P of G, here we're going to just use the definition, P of G is in script H. It's not equal, sorry. That's a definition. So what can we say about the inverse of P of G? Script H is a subgroup of script G. Yeah, the inverse of the inverse of elements of H are in H because it's a subgroup, right? script H. I'm sorry, I'm, I should have had like H one and H two. I shouldn't, but this, I'm calling this script H and this regular H. Okay. So then if they're in script H, then they're elements of H. <clears throat> elements of H are element, elements of script H are elements of script H, but this is a subgroup of script G, a larger, potentially larger set. And so since it's a subgroup, this guy has its inverse is in that, in that set. This guy, just because it's a subgroup. But this is equal to B of G inverse, which I think you've shown in a homework problem. So by definition, G inverse is in the script is an H, regular H. And finally, if I have like G1 and G2 in H, then, well, this is just a very simple, we need to show what, what do we need to show the last thing for a subgroup? Closer, right, closure under composition. So we know that, but we can just kind of check it really quickly. B of G1, G2, using the property of being a homomorphism is equal to B of G1, B of G2. Both of these, by definition of H, are in script H. So this, their product is in script H. And so that's, so all three properties are satisfied for H, meaning it's a subject of G. Okay, I'm gonna skip the part on normality. Um, again, just read through it if you have any. It's, it's not much different than what we're doing right here. Uh, it's kind of, you just kind of use the basic properties and definitions. Okay. So the point of this proposition, though, is actually to give this correspondence theorem um, that, we, that we want to detail. And this correspondence theorem really gives us a sense as to how to relate a group to 
its image of a, under a homomorphism. So let's say you have a homomorphism. Somehow I've managed to avoid using this language so far. So if I have a homomorphism, say from G to G tilde, I can talk about the image of the homomorphism. And this is just equal to what we, you would call in calculus the range of the function, right? It's the set of all of the elements that are actually hit here. So this is just the set inside of G, script G of all of these guys. Think of it as the range if you want. I mean, don't think of it as being in a line or in space or anything, but. Anyway, this guy is a subgroup, as is easily shown, similar to what we just did. And what this correspondence theorem says is that if you have one of these homomorphisms, you can understand quite a bit about the group by understanding about something about the range, by understanding the range. I mean, we, so let me break down that, turn that theorem over, and then we'll. This is actually. This theorem is actually of some use in when we start looking at fields later on. Well, we probably won't do any Galois theory here, but there's a very tight relationship here. You know. All right, so this is the correspondence. So, it's taught, this talks about a surjective group homomorphism. A surjective group homomorphism. Remember, that's onto, meaning that every, the image of this is all of them. The image is everything. We have this kernel K. And the statement says is that we have a bijection, bijective correspondence, so one to one onto, correspondence between the subgroups of G that contain our kernel. And the subgroups of script G. It's a little more than that, actually. It's a, it's the correspondence preserves inclusion. In other words, you can think of let's say you have this group G here, and you have this you have this kernel K. You can think of a bunch of other groups that contain K. Let's mm -hmm. say you have K one. Then let's say there's some groups in between that contain these guys. And you kind of draw a little diagram of more and more groups. Let's say you have a bunch of subgroups. Think of them as subsets. And this, what is this? What are these kinds of arrows that means that one is contained in the other? It's like a what's called a lattice of subgroups. So it tells you some ordering. Things one is contained in the other one. But these there may be other groups inside of G. There may be some other groups over here, but these are all of the ones that contain K. Your kernel. But then the point is, is what this correspondence theorem is saying: just take a copy of this picture and just you know, you can replace all of these with, with scripts. But now you get one here. So in other words, all if you look at all the subgroups over here, all the subgroups, okay, nothing about a kernel or anything, all, all of the subgroups, I can I get this one-to-one -one correspondence between them and their inverse images. So it tells you a lot about the sort of structure of this group, which may be more complicated up here by understanding kind of its image in this potentially smaller group. Yeah. Well, let's look at the core, what the correspondence is. It's a, good, a very good question. So what is this correspondence? So the correspondence is given by following. I have a subgroup uh, H 
a subgroup of G, I'm going to send it to the image. Well, basically the phi of H. Right. This, this is just the image of phi restricted to H. So it's all elements, phi of H, H and H. Of course, I want this H. I'm going to just be considering those subgroups that contain K on the G side. You can take the image of phi with respect to any subgroup. You'll get a subgroup. That's okay. But I want to just look at the one. The correspondence is just for those. So now let me answer your question. So what happens to K if I do this? What's the image of K under phi? It's the kernel. It's the definition of the kernel. The kernel is a set of elements of G that under the homomorphism, they go to one. This is K is going to be sent to one. Now, what's the, what's the inverse? So if we want a correspondence like this, you know, one-to-one -one correspondence, I just defined a function, which will take a subgroup containing K and give you a subgroup of G. If I want a one-to-one -one correspondence, the easiest thing to do is to give you, yourself an inverse map, right? Give yourself an inverse set map and show that that is a set inverse. So if I call this assignment, I don't know, let's call this assignment uh, um, um, I guess we could do capital. <laughs> so I, I can so this will be capital P. This goes from uh, from subgroups. This, this assignment. To take this, I'm going to take the subgroups, subgroups uh, G containing K as a set. It's going to give me a subgroup of G tilde or sub. sub, sub So as I was saying, I needed an inverse function. So I claim that this is precisely taking the inverse image. So I have a script H, any script H, any subgroup, and I can take the inverse. <clears throat> and I know by what we just proved that that's a subgroup of G, but furthermore, it's easy to see that if I look at this, the kernel of phi is contained in this, right? Is that easy to see for everybody? Okay. Yeah. This is this is the set of all of the elements in G that are mapped to script H. So script H has one. So all of the elements of G that map to one are in this. So all the elements of G that map to one, that's by definition the kernel. So this gives you a map and I don't, I mean, I think that the you can prove this given what, what I've just done. I mean, prove the theorem that these are inverses. I mean, if you, if you want, we can do it. If you want to see that. Okay. okay let's look. You, you don't believe it? <laughs> I love it. You don't believe me. No trust, no trust. You're the man. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so proof that this is this is I probably shouldn't call this the inverse. I'm going to prove it the inverse. I made that claim, but let's call it psi instead of phi. The number I is uh, an inverse function. So, so we want to show. Now, I'm going to leave to you, which is not included in this uh, statement, the fact that these are both uh, inclusion preserving. In other words, if I have, if I have an, two subgroups in here, if I have two subgroups in here, 
H1 and H2, and H1 is contained in H2, then this map will preserve that contained P of H1 to be contained in P of H2. So that lattice picture I just drew pulled, but I'm not going to talk about that. Want to show? Want to show? What the shoot? <laughs> So let's see. So let's let's take psi uh, composed with B of H. Okay, well, this equals by definition <coughs> the inverse of B. So this equals the set of all G and G such that B of G equal to uh, B of G prime sum prime. I'm gonna show that's H. Well, note, H is certainly contained in B inverse. I'm sorry, B inverse of B. Because it's <laughs> silly. B of H. All right, so we want to show the reverse inclusion. I want to show the reverse inclusion. Now suppose, now suppose a K is an element of the inverse H, then there is H and H with BK equaling B of H, right? That's this definition. I'm just calling K H G prime. Taking H G G prime. So K is in here, so K is one of these guys. So I have to find something in here for which this is. Make sense? So now tell me about it. What can I do? You guys help me. Awfully talkative today. So what I one thing you can do is there's not much you can do with groups. Like if you're manipulating an equation, you can't like add and multiply by 15 or something like that. The only thing you can kind of do is multiply by you can or take you know the, whatever the composition takes in person. So here I can take both sides and I can take the inverse. So if I do that, I'll get phi of uh, h inverse phi of k. This is equal to one of g. It's multiplying. I mean, I'm in the world of g script g right now. I'm looking at P, images of P. But then what is this left hand side? Someone tell me, can I use the homomorphism properties to write, rewrite this left hand side? H. Close. I want to put everything under parentheses. So H inverse K. I can't, yeah. I can bring the inverse in and then I use the homomorphism property. So what can you, now what can you tell me about this element? It's in the kernel. Definition of the kernel is a set of elements that can sense its identity. 
this element gets simplified down. Now, here's where you need to use, this is equal to cap A as well. Here's where you need to use the fact that we're not starting with any old subgroup here. This, this H is in here, subgroups that contain K. And so this guy is actually a subgroup of H. <clears throat> But now I've got H, lowercase h is an H, and this element is an H. So H times H inverse of K, which is K, is an element of H. That's what I want to show. I started with this guy, and I got that indeed it was an H. Yes. We have the reverse inclusion. I mean, I've got both of these. Okay. So that's that shows you that shows you that capital Phi is a left inverse of capital Phi. Um, the other way is even easier. Uh, I mean, I, I guess the other way is, is quite easy. So also, well, what is B of psi inverse, or psi, I'm sorry, psi of B? This is B of B inverse of H. Um, but now, so, I guess we need to say one thing here. This equals B of G for all G element of the inverse H. But what is the condition of G being in the inverse of H? B of G for all, for all G and G such that B of G is an H. So you need to use one thing to say that this is actually script H. What is that? One, one condition. Why is this H? I claim this is equal to H because I mean, script H or regular H? Script H. Uh, yeah, I'm trying, hopefully, I'm sure I miss saying it, but I hope I'm writing it uh, correctly. Uh, so in LaTeX, you use, you use PAL, map PAL, the right view sometimes. So sometimes you say PAL, but, but yeah, I'll just call it script H. So why is this script H? Well, certainly contained in H, right? Because we have, this is all G such that their images are contained here, right? So everything that, everything, every phi of G has to be in H. So this is contained in H. But why do I get all of it? Alt script H. I get all script H. Let's look back at the conditions. What is the correspondence of? Let's be. Surjective. Surjective. So, if, since it's surjective, any element in H, there is a G for which B of G equals that element. Any element in script G, there is an element G, but certainly for a subset, any element in script H, I can find some G that's sent to. Definition of surjectivity. 
So this is saying, okay, well, this is not just contained in script H, it has all of it because it's on. So you need that surjectivity in order for this correspondence theorem to be true. Otherwise, it's not quite true. Okay, guys. That's that. So now to give an example um, where they talk about this correspondence theorem and they looked at this, a homomorphism from S4 to S3, which is a really funky looking homomorphism. Um, I, uh, I kind of want to skip that. I kind of want to skip that. But I do want to mention one thing, which is helpful in, you know, as you do some examples in, uh, in the book or in, you know, as we do some other applications. And that is to understand what conjugation in SN looks like in the symmetric group. Uh, I'll just, so you know by now that every permutation can be written as a product of disjoint side cycles, more or less uniquely. So if you conjugate, you can sort of conjugate cycle by cycle. And so it, it suffices, if you want to understand conjugation in SN, it suffices to understand what, how you conjugate a cycle by some permutation. So let's suppose Uh, sigma is an element of SN. A student, this is the second time this has happened to me. A student came up to me and said, Dr. Kerry, you don't know what you're doing. That's, that's I, I was, it was Cal 3 or something. I've written Delta. Delta is this. Alphabets have capital lowercase. Hard, hard being a professor. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, so this is sigma. So suppose sigma is an SN and uh, And we have some cycle. So I'll write this with indices I1, I2, I k. It's a k cycle. Remember that just means it's the permutation that sort of takes I1 to I2, I2 to I3 all the way around until you get to I k, and then I k goes to I1. Well, then there's this really cool thing that you can do. You can just, let's say you want to conjugate this by like sigma. You want to understand what you get. What you get is you can actually just sort of input each of the i's into sigma to see where sigma sends it. And that will indeed be the cycle. You get a new k cycle, but now you're replacing the, I, the i's with their images under sigma. So maybe we can do a number, a numerical example. You can see what I'm talking about. Um, example. Let's take, I don't know, S4, we can take one, three, four, and let's take sigma to equal one, two. Well, okay, we can straight up multiply. Of course, this sigma has its own inverse. So because it's its own inverse, we can just write it. The sigma. Let's just multiply. Okay, so see where one goes. One goes to two. One goes to two, 
nothing happens here for two, nothing here, and then two goes back to one. So nothing happens with one. We have to then go to two. Two goes to one. Ah. And I don't trust Apple. Like I told them not to give me any notifications. I'll solve faith in today. Okay, one goes to two. One, or sorry, two goes to one. One goes to three. Three goes to four. So two is going to go to four. Okay. I'll trace where four goes. Four goes to three. Three goes to four. Four goes back to three again. And finally, the only thing, uh, well, I'm not to check where three goes. Three goes to four. Four goes to three. Three goes to four. What do I do? Well, what do I do? Did I, I, did I miss something? Did I not write something down? Four goes to four. Yeah. Four goes to three. Oh, yeah, thank you. Three goes to four. Four goes to one. <laughs> One goes to two. Yes, yeah, so the universe breaks sometimes. And I think we complete the cycle, right? Let's just double check. Two goes to one, one goes to three, three goes to four. Good. Open that. All right, so now, but now we can check and see, what is this? Well, if I look, I wanna say, I wanna claim that this is sigma one, sigma three, and sigma four. Well, sigma of one, Sigma of one is two, sigma of three is four, and sigma of four is three. And indeed, while these aren't, I mean, cycles are unique up to sort of drug theory, right? So this is indeed, these two things are indeed unique. Four, three, two, four, three, two, four. So this is a, a quick way of conjugating. Conjugating an SN is actually not that hard. And conjugation is a very important operation in, in groups. As you see in the definition of normal subgroup, uh, this is something that is it's all over. The most you simplify groups into a normal group. Very special. Okay. So in particular, you can kind of see you can see this, I was gonna talk about this correspondence. Well, at least if you, if you know this conjugation, if you read this section uh, with the correspondence theorem, you can understand the example. Because uh, they're, what they show is they, their homomorphism from S4 to S3 is given by essentially letting S4 conjugate the three, uh, the three permutations that look like this. So there are three permutations that look like this. One, two, three, four, uh, one, three, two, four, and then one, four, two, three. So there are three elements in here that have this kind of type of product of cycles, namely just doing transpositions in S4. So if you conjugate these on A, B, and C, if you conjugate them by elements of S4, they'll be permuted. Those three. Cycles or permutations will be muted themselves. So that gives you a, a morphism from here to here. That's, you're just you're taking a permutation, you see how it permutes these guys under conjugation, and that gives you a permutation on three. That's their homomorphism. So I'll let you guys read about that. Um, and okay, and so the, the last thing I wanted to do today, um, which I'm not sure I'm going to get through, but let's let's give it a try. And I'll, I'll I have some nice graphics and some examples we can look at. Not graphics, but tables. Um, with this uh, theorem, I'm going to have to go to my notes. For this theorem. So there's this, this last section that I wanted to talk about uh, is dealing with products of groups. 
And the kind of main proposition in that theorem, uh, in that section is this proposition here. It relates essentially, which says one thing we can do if we have two subgroups of a group G is we can take their product group and we can map it into G, okay? And the way we do that is we just take an, we just consider F of HK equal to H times K. So remember this, I talked about this, I think, I don't know, last time or the time before, HK, this is just the product, Cartesian product, you know, product of tuples, one from H and one from K. So this equals just all pairs HK, H is an H. This is a group under just, you know, the worded wise law of composition. This gives you a group. Now this map F is not a homomorphism in general, not a homomorphism. And so one of the statements will be uh, that this is, a, the only way it's a homomorphism is if the elements of H commute with those of K. That's the only way. If they don't commute, then you don't get a homomorphism. This is just a set map. Maps elements in here, elements in here. Furthermore, it's worse than the image. Well, you can see that the image HK of F, this is actually going to be a collection of cosets, left cosets of K or right cosets of H, either way you want to think about it. But it's not, even the image is not a group unless. You have one of these groups to be normal. So I think this is this. Is. But then there are statements about when it's injective and when it's uh, an isomorphism. So when it's onto. So I'm not going to be able to prove all of it or any of it, but I wanted to actually illustrate a couple of points about it. I think next time we maybe we'll prove a little bit next time, but let's do some, let's have some fun here. Um, and sort of see some some examples here. So let's go to let's go to my my favorite table. I made a couple more. S three. I want to look at this in this. I want to look at this proposition in this context for, for this example. So so what what we're going to pick out two uh, sub. So let's take, um, we'll take H to be one and, I don't know, one, two. I'll say one, two. That's a subgroup, right? Because it's a transposition. So if I square it, I get one, close under composition, inverses are there, one's in it. I can take another, so this will be my, H is there. I'll take K to be the subgroup one, one, or two, three. That's a subgroup for the same reason. And I want to look at this, this set HK. But this, there's nothing more than what you would expect to do. You're just multiplying elements. So when you have a table right in front of you, you can actually see what it is, right? You just, well, just uh, oh, oh. get those four elements. Now, the reason I look at this, I want wanted to look at this example. Well, this is certainly not a homomorphism because these one, two, and two, three, they don't commute as permutations. Moreover, you can see that this image is actually not a subgroup either. Why isn't it a subgroup? It's not closed under what can you give me an example? One three by one three two. One three by one three two. Which way? Just multiply that way. Okay, so one, three. Okay, 
So one goes to three, goes to two, and two goes to one. Good, not in here. You can also just see that the inverse of this guy is another three cycle, it's one, two, three. That's not in here. So taking two subgroups of a larger group and just taking sort of their product doesn't give you a subgroup. However, if you may, if you looked at a normal subgroup, one of these were normal. So I changed this example to the following. I took H being one. This is a normal subgroup. This is A3. Then all of a sudden I do get uh, a subgroup. And you can check this, but you can also just write it out. What is the subgroup we get? We get everything. So normality starts having a big effect. If you're really interested in studying groups and understanding their structure, you'll see that normality starts taking a central role and saying, okay, the normal subgroups, they're special. The other ones, they're all over the place, but they're complicated. They don't satisfy all the nice properties that the normal ones do. Okay, guys, so we'll continue. I'll try to prove a couple of things about this next time and then we'll uh, finish up with portion groups.